design patterns, uh, practical design patterns in PHP. Um, I would like this talk to be uh, practical because patterns are quite uh, theoretical and uh, I will show you some implementation of well-known design patterns using uh, PHP and some concrete uh, examples you can find maybe in many PHP libraries. Uh, so my name is Hugo, I'm the head of the training department uh, at Sensor Labs France. Uh, I live in Paris and uh, I'm known as HMN on Twitter. Uh, so feel free to follow me. Uh, and also I work at Sensor Labs. So patterns, uh, what are design patterns? I guess some of you already uh, know design patterns or maybe the definition. Uh, so basically a pattern is just a generic abstract solution uh, which solves a particular problem which is uh, which has already occurred in many uh, software designs um, and so by definition we have 23 patterns uh, referenced and I will show you uh, a couple of them not all because uh, we, we would need more than a, a full day of conference uh, to cover all of them uh, the main advantage of patterns is that they provide uh, a common language, a common vocabulary to all the developers. So if you use or if you implement a pattern, uh, the other developers will be able to understand what you did in your uh, software design. So that's the main, uh, the main goal of using design patterns. And they also help to um, uh, make your code more testable and more flexible if you want to be able to change uh, in the future uh, your code base. Um, so in, uh, in the theory we have three different kind of patterns. Uh, they are categorized in these three different categories. The creation patterns which uh, tells how to, how to create uh, objects, how to initialize objects. And then you have structural patterns um, which uh, uh, organize the code uh, and the classes together and uh, shows how these components work together. And finally, uh, we have uh, the behavior patterns, which uh, also uh, explain how to uh, make the objects collaborate. If you want to know more about patterns, you have the first book with here at first, which is very interesting because they have lots of uh, practical examples, practical exercises. And the second one is uh, a book about arch architecture design patterns. So I will not talk about architectural patterns, but in this book you will find topics like MVC, uh, Active Records, Data Mapper and stuff like that. So both of them are really interesting. Uh, before we start, just uh, a small disclaimer. Patterns are not the only gray. Uh, they, you, you should take inspiration on them. Uh, uh, don't abstract too much. Uh, don't use them as is. Uh, don't over-engineer your code. Try to keep uh, being pragmatic uh, and try to keep things simple, but take inspiration on uh, the patterns to uh, uh, implement them in your code. So today I have a list of eight patterns to introduce, so I hope I will have enough time to, uh, to talk about them. And I will start with uh, the facade pattern. So facade is probably the simplest patterns you can, uh, you can use, you can implement. And I guess you all already uh, used the, the facet pattern, maybe without knowing that it's the, the facet patterns. So basically, this pattern um, helps you to, to, um, to encapsulate a complex algorithm or a complex task into uh, uh, an object, in, into a class, and expose uh, a simpler interface to use it. So for my example, uh, I'm using the, uh, the, an XML feed uh, parsing. Imagine you have a feed uh, that you want to pass and by default in your code you have uh, this kind of code you have uh, you are opening the, uh, the XML field with simple XML element and then you are trying to fetch some information from this XML field. So this code as is is quite complex uh, because you have lots of business logic in this. And so using the facet you will simply encapsulate this complex logic into an object and then expose a very simple API. So you just have to create a class and then all your complex logic will be encapsulated into uh, methods. Okay, so that's basically this uh, facet pattern. So in my main code, in my client code, I can just use my uh, field reader object and then use my uh, very simple API to fetch the information from my XML definition. So there's no complex logic in, the, in this code anymore. 
So that's basically the first set pattern. Second one is adapter, which is a very interesting one. And it's a structural pattern. It provides it pro provides a unique API to your object that don't have the same uh, API. So for my, uh, my example, I will use uh, um, two uh, different service providers to get forecasts. Okay, imagine you want to fetch forecasts with two uh, web services, and these two web services uh, have a different API. So imagine first, uh, service, first service provider, we have a Wahoo weather service provider. And thanks to this service provider, I will be able to collect some forecasts. So I'm using this kind of API. We have a weather service client, a client object, which is the main object. And this main object, whoops, this main object receives a Wahoo weather API uh, object. And thanks to this API, I can fetch some forecast for specific city and a specific date. As you can see, I'm receiving this object, Wow Weather API, which is a concrete dependency. It's a concrete, uh, concrete class, concrete object. And I'm using this method, which is the current API, because right now I'm using this uh, service provider, uh, and I didn't, I haven't think of using other service provider. So right now my application is frozen to, uh, uh, to use this only uh, provider. But now, we, it's time to change. My application uh, has evolved, and we have a new competitor on, on the market, which is Google. And Google provides a new um, service provider to fetch a forecast. And I want to uh, be able to support both um, APIs, both service providers. The problem is that my application is stuck to use the previous well weather provider. So I want my client object to support both, um, both, uh, both uh, service providers. So if I recap, we have the Wow Weather API object, which has this get city forecast method, which takes the city, the date in this format, and it returns uh, an array of conditions, of forecast conditions. But now, I want to integrate Google with a provider, because Google is interesting, and Google has a different API. Uh, I have to use public properties to set the, the city and the date, the date is the, must be specified in this format, and we have this method get forecast, uh, which returns a JSON string. So, as you can see, we have a completely different, um, a completely different API uh, in both uh, service providers. So, methods are different. The, the date format is different. Uh, we in, in one side we have an array, in the other side we have a JSON string. So, I want to make my main client object. Uh, to use these two uh, objects. So we have to implement this adapter pattern to be able to adapt the uh, heterogeneous adaptees, which are the two service providers. So think of a power plug. An adapter is just a, like a power plug. When you are, when you are traveling in another country, you want, if you want to plug your um, power plug, uh, you may need a power plug. For example, Plugs in the US and in, in Belgium are different, so you need a power plug. So this is my adapter, which adapts my adaptees. So how to achieve that? I just have to implement my adapter class, which is, in this case, an abstract class. And it provides the common uh, public API I want to expose. So I want to expose a set date method, and I want to expose a get forecast uh, method, which for now it's private, it's uh, abstract because I'm not able to uh, implement uh, the content. And then I will implement two adapters for my two service providers. The first one is for the Wow Weather Provider. So I have a Wow Provider adapter which extends my abstract adapter. And it receives my previous Wow Weather API object. And then inside, I will simply uh, implement the get forecast method and adapt the code for this uh, service provider. And I know that this method already returns the expected uh, associative array. And for my Google service provider, I will add this uh, Google provider adapter class, which also extends weather provider uh, adapter. It receives the Google Weather API object. And then, in this case, I adapt the code. So we know that the API requires public properties to be set. 
we know that we have to format the, uh, the date for this uh, uh, provider. And we know that also we can get the JSON, uh, a JSON string in return. So I have to pass the JSON string to return the normalized associative array I expect in return. So that's how to implement this, uh, this pattern. So in the end, my client object, the main resource service object, now receives a weather provider adapter object instead of a concrete implementation. And it delegates uh, the work of the get forecast method to my uh, uh, provider uh, adapter. Okay, so we now have this abstraction. So I'm using an abstract uh, class or an interface to type the parameter to make it more flexible. And I'm using this public API, which is defined by my uh, adapter. So in the end, my well weather API object is wrapped into the adapter. And same for Google Weather, which is wrapped into Google Provider Adapter. And my main weather service object receives the adapter uh, to adapt the two service providers. And that's all. If tomorrow there's another competitor on the market, I will just have to create a new adapter for this uh, new competitor. And I will be able to uh, pass my adapter to my main client object. And that's all. So no need to change the internal of my weather service uh, object. OK, it's clear enough right now? OK. Um, so third pattern, template method, uh, which is a very simple uh, uh, pattern. So this pattern lets, you, uh, lets your subclasses redefine parts of an algorithm uh, which is defined in the, in the, in the abstract, uh, in, in the upper class, in the, in the superclass. So, uh, it allows you to just change part of an algorithm. So for my practical example, I want to use uh, a mapper object. I want to map PHP object to a database. And my uh, data store can be anything. It can be MySQL, it can be a NoSQL database like MongoDB, it can be Memcache or I don't know, Redis, whatever. Um, so the saving process will be different based on uh, the, um, uh, the data store I want to use. So as you can see, I will define a base, a base mapper class, which contains my template method, which is this one, the save method. And as you can see, this save method is public, and it's also uh, final. This is the, the most important thing to notice. This method is final. And this method defines uh, the algorithm to save uh, an object to, to the data store, and it uses these three uh, protected methods. Okay? So as this method is final, I can't override it in my two uh, subclasses, but I can override just these uh, three methods. So my relational mapper, which maps objects to a, a relational database, will, um, uh, will handle the saving to a relational database like MySQL, and this one will handle the saving to a NoSQL database like MongoDB. Okay, so this is my template method in my abstract mapper class. So it says that if I can have a primary key, I will update the record. Otherwise, I will insert the record. So I want to change one of these uh, part of the algorithm uh, just by overriding the three uh, protected methods. So I just have to override this method to change one, uh, one of these steps in the, uh, in, the, in the save algorithm. So my article mapper, as you can see, receives a PDO object. And it tries to fetch the primary key from uh, the array of data I want, to, uh, I want to save. And to save to my SQL or to my uh, relational database, I will make a, a prepared statement. And same for uh, the, uh, the updates. And for my NoSQL mapper, let's say we want to, log, uh, log, we want to, to, to save logs in a, in a log mapper. So I want to use MongoDB for this one. So I will inject a Mongo uh, object. And I will just override the three methods to store my data to a uh, MongoDB. So in the end, I will just have to instantiate my log mapper or uh, relational mapper. And then I will use the same save method uh, in, my, uh, in my code. And the save method just inserts or uh, updates the, the, the record. So that's pretty easy. Um, strategy. So this one is uh, quite important. It's, I think, one of the, the, the patterns I use the most. Um, 
So it allows you to change uh, an algorithm, to make algorithm uh, interchangeable depending on, on the context. So for example, you want to change uh, the way you store your object or you want to change a scoring. Uh, strategy. For example, you have a game, you, 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 uh, you created a game, and with the game you want to change the, the way uh, the score is calculated depending on some uh, uh, arguments. Um, or I don't know uh, what we have. Um, yes, you can use a sort strategy for uh, different sorting algorithm or, co or comparison uh, algorithm. So this is the pattern to use. So it allows you to, um, to encapsulate an algorithm and to make this uh, algorithm interchangeable in your object. So this is another example. I want to, uh, to change the way my emails are sent with my mailer object, my main mailer, ob my main mailer object. So imagine we have this class, mailer, and this mailer class receives a message object. And I want to send a message, an email, to uh, the recipient. So by default, right now, I'm using the PHP mail function to send my, uh, my email. But tomorrow, I want to use an SMTP connection, or I want to uh, emulate this email sending if I'm using a dev environment or a testing environment, because I don't want to send uh, the, the email uh, in real time. So what if we want to support an SMTP uh, connection to send the email? Basically, we can do that. Big condition, if SMTP equals transport, and send email with the SMTP connection, or use mail function, or use uh, something else. But of course, that's not very flexible. As long as you have conditions like this, it makes your code less flexible, less testable. So the best is to implement a strategy. And you can define your strategy using an abstract class or, for example, an interface. So I'm defining a very simple and clean mail transport interface, which just exposes um, a send method that I will have to implement. And then I will just implement this interface in, in several classes. Uh, okay, so I will define a mail uh, a mail transport class because I want to send emails using the the mail PHP function. So this is uh, the use of the mail PHP function, and I also implement an SMTP transport class. And in this case, I will send my email using an SMTP connection. And if I want to use um, if I don't want to send emails because I'm using a testing environment, I can implement a null transport uh, uh, strategy. And then the algorithm will be uh, this one. Okay. So now in the code, in the main code, in my mailer object, I just have to inject a mail transport interface uh, concrete implementation. So this is my abstraction. And, oops, and then I will use the send method here. So no need to tweak this class, this class just delegates uh, my email sending to uh, the corresponding transport layer. And that's the strategy uh, pattern. It's as uh, simple as, as this. Okay, so just create one of these strategies and then you inject the strategies in your uh, mail object. Um. Oh, I'm going too fast. Sucks. Okay, this one, uh, decorator. So decorator is also very, very interesting. Um, it allows you to extend the capabilities of a class to extend the, the responsibilities of an object uh, without using inheritance. So you will use composition uh, over inheritance. Okay. So that's why I chose this uh, picture because we have an object which is decorated by this object, which is decorated by this object, and then. Uh, thanks to this encapsulation, we can uh, add new uh, capabilities to an object. Okay. Um, so in, in this case, we will use composition over inheritance. So let's say we want to add new responsibilities to a database connection. This is a very common, um, uh, very common problem. So let's say we have this connection class, okay, very simple. My connection class implements an interface. We don't care, but it receives a PDO connection and a logger object, which may be no, because sometimes we don't want to log anything in the, uh, in the object. And uh, it also counts the queries I've executed with this uh, connection object. Okay? 
and I have a method to get the query count. And so I have a query method which queries the database. And as you can see in this query method, if there's a logger, I will log something and I will also increase the, the query count and then I will execute my uh, SQL query. Okay. That's uh, a simple implementation. This is not the, the, the uh, decorator pattern right now, but this is my problem. I, I want to solve this, uh, this problem. Uh, can you spot the problem with this implementation? Anyone has an ID? Sorry? Yes, but that's not the main problem. It might be no, but there's something with this, uh, with this code. Yep. Oh, I can't hear you in the back. Okay, I have time, so I will move. How to gain time in the conference. Actually, you're not counting the queries, you're counting the number of times you log something. Um, yeah. yeah. But if you, if we have, at yeah, but if you have one, one query executed, it just incremented. Oh, okay. The problem. Okay. <coughs> doing sports, doing sports at a conference. Okay. So the problem is if you use this in production, okay, in production, you will have this small override of checking if the logger uh, is uh, set or not, okay? And I don't think you want to have this very small override in your, uh, in your application, okay? You just want a very simple database connection that just queries the database and fetch the results and return the results. You don't want to have this uh, logger object, okay? So I want to move this code somewhere else uh, to make my uh, connection object um, uh, decouple uh, from the, the logging system, okay? So we have a very small overhead in production if we have to use this, uh, uh, this code. So how to do that? Um, so we will implement the decorator pattern like this. So we have the base connection class, okay? Uh, which is this one, and imagine you also want to manage uh, a master-slave connection, okay? So you want a connection that wraps the master connection and the slave connection. So basically you will just create a master-slave connection uh, object, which uh, a master-slave master connection class, which inherits from connection and which overrides the constructor method to inject the master connection and a slave connection. But imagine now you want to have a master-slave connection, which also profiles your connection, okay, which counts uh, the number of queries executed, which uh, times the, the, the queries. And so you want the, the, the connection to be profiled. So you want to profile a very simple connection, but you also want to, prov to, um, uh, to profile a master slave connection. So if you use inheritance, that's not possible. You will, be, uh, you will reach a certain limit uh, at some point. So the best is to use the decorator pattern in this case. So you have to create this abstract connection decorator object, and then you will inherit this decorator uh, for, the, for the new uh, subclasses. Okay, so I will decorate uh, my connection object or my master slave connection object inside a profiled connection object. And as we are using inheritance, we are keeping the main, uh, the main type, the main uh, uh, interface, okay? So my decorator is this object, connection decorator. It implements my connection interface, uh, interface. And as you can see, the decorator wraps or decorates uh, a connection object, a connection interface object. So instead of using inheritance, we are using composition by injecting an object of the same type uh, in the in this object, and so my uh, query method just executes the query on the main connection object, and then my profiled connection class receives 
my connection object, but it also receives the logger object. So in this situation, I want to have a connection which is profiled for my development environment or my testing environment, but not for production. So I can inject my logger, I can uh, uh, increment uh, the query count. So if I override the query method, I will just log the, uh, the query, query uh, count plus plus, and then execute the default, um, uh, the default uh, method in the parent class. Okay? So now, in my, in my code, I can easily create my very simple connection object or my master-slave connection object, if I want to use a master-slave uh, connection. And I want to profile this connection with a profiled connection object. So I just wrap the main connection object into my profiled connection object. That's the decorator uh, implementation. Okay. So in development, you will instantiate a profile connection object. In production, you will just instantiate a connection object. Okay. And then this code will remain the same in your, in your code base. You don't have to touch this, uh, this client code. <coughs> so as you can see, it's very easy to extend the object capabilities with the, the decorator pattern. You just wrap, uh, you decorate an object. Um, the main drawback uh, with this uh, implementation is that uh, you can't test against the concrete object type. As you are using uh, a decorator, if you want to check that your object is, uh, for example, a master-slave connection object, you can't because if you do if connection instance of master-slave, for example, it will tell you that it's not a master-slave connection because you are using a profiled uh, connection object and not a master-slave which is wrapped inside the profile connection. So this is uh, one of the main drawbacks of using uh, this. If you have to check the, the type at one time, you may have this uh, problem. Okay. Okay, so composites, uh, another pattern, which allows you to um, represent trees in a uh, or hierarchical type uh, structure. For example, you want to uh, represent uh, a, a directory tree structure, or you want to represent a family tree, or something like that, or a menu with item and sub items. You will use the composite uh, pattern. Okay, so these patterns lets you treat individual objects and composition of objects as if they were uh, a single uh, object. Okay. So for my example, I'm using uh, an HTML form. I want to represent a complex HTML form. So this uh, implementation is, uh, I took this inspiration uh, for this example in the Symfony framework because in Symfony we have um, uh, a form system, a form framework system to, to create forms and, and, and validate forms. And we can create embedded forms. So we can create very complex form uh, by embedding form into, uh, into, uh, into the others. Oh, okay. So this is video projector. It's not really good. So we have a, a name field, which is an input field. We have a texturier field. And we have a picture subform, which contains an input file input file uh, tag and um, a text area for the caption. Okay, so we have a main form which includes a sub form. Okay, so I want to represent this form uh, with, uh, with a composite. So we have a main form object which contains an input text, which contains a text area, which contains a sub form object, which contains an input text and an input file uh, for including a picture. Okay. So I want to deal with this implementation. So using composite, that will be possible. Okay. So I will treat uh, everything as a field, everything as a single field, which means a single field is a single field. For example, an input or a text area is a single field. But a form is also a field which contains fields. Okay. So that's uh, the, the composite uh, um, uh, pattern. So. I have a base class, which is field. And in this uh, base class, there's a method to set the data, to set the value of the field. And so I have subclasses to create input or text areas or, I don't know, a radio button. So we have an input, an input um, 
uh, method. I can override the set data method if, ne if necessary. And then I will say I also have a form class which extends field. So a form is also a field. And the form can embed uh, field objects. Okay, so I can embed subfields in a, into a form object. So basically, I will have this implementation. So this is my main form, which is uh, the name of the form is product, for example. And I want my product to have a name, which is uh, an input text. I want to have a description, which is a text area uh, object. And then I will have a subform because I want to uh, to add photos for my uh, for my uh, for my form. So a photo is made of two fields: a caption field, which is a text, or, uh, a text and image, which is a file uh, object. And then in the main form, this one, I will embed the picture uh, form. And then when I will set the data. I will set the data using an array, so there's a name uh, key which, which belongs to this name field, description, and the photo with the sub uh, information inside. So when I set the data uh, of the main form, it will also uh, dig into the sub forms, uh, sub, into the sub fields to set the data of the sub fields. Okay. So the implementation is quite easy to achieve. So there's the abstract class field with the set data method, which stores the data of a single field. So for an input field, this is very simple. If, um, if it's an input text, I will set the data up. But if it's a file uh, or if it's a password, for example, I don't want uh, to set the, the data. Uh, and the form extends fields, and it contains a collection of fields. So there's a method to add a new, uh, a new field, so the name of the field and the field object. And I just override the set data method to iterate over the subfields and then call the set data uh, method on each subfield to set the data uh, recursively. Okay. And that's all. You have an implementation of the composite uh, pattern. And same for getting the data. If I want to get the data of the subfield, I just have to iterate over the fields and then uh, create the array uh, recursively. Um, factory method. So this one is a creation pattern. So uh, it, it, it explains how to uh, create and initialize uh, objects. So factory method defines an interface for creating an object. But it lets the subclasses decide which kind of object you want to create. Okay, so we will see the difference. Let's say, for example, you want to manage uh, files in your application, and you want to represent each file with a specific class. So you have text files, you have pictures, you have PDF files. So you will create uh, a different class for each type of uh, files you want to manage. So I want to manage document objects. So basically, you may do that, a document factory uh, class with a, a method, a, a static method, get document, which receives the type, and depending on the type, you will instantiate a specific type of object. Yeah, so that's uh, a way of doing that, but that's not the factory, pa the factory method pattern. This is just uh, an idiom of, programmi of, of programming, okay? just uh, what we call um, a static factory uh, pattern, but it's just a, 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 an idiom of, uh, of programming. So remember that the factory method pattern tells you that you have to, s to let the subclasses def um, do the instantiation. Okay? So we have to have subclasses. Um, so this is my document factory abstract class, which has uh, a new document method which is public. Okay? And so I can give a name to my document, I can give a, a content to my document. And this class also has um, an abstract create document method. And this is the, the, the factory method that we have to implement in the subclasses. Okay? And this new document method creates a document using the create document method. So my sub factory um, classes implement the create document method. So my image file factory uh, creates image object, which is a document abstract object. And if I create a PDF file factory, for example, it will create a PDF object. Okay. So my document factory object 
has this create document abstract method. And there's a new document uh, method, which is the same method for, for every uh, subclasses. Okay? So if you want to create a document, you say new document, you pass a name and a content. Then it creates a document, but at this point, you can't know which kind of object you want to create. Okay, so that's why there's an abstract factory method. I don't know if I want to create an image or uh, a PDF file or, I don't know, a video, but I know that all of these files have the same common information, a directory in which they are located, they have a content which can be text or binary, uh, and they can be saved. Okay. So my text file factory extends document factory, and then it just creates, it, it just returns a basic text document, okay, so a regular document object. And if I want to create pictures, I have to, I have to implement an image file factory, and I just override the create document method. And in this case, I want to create an image, but an image also has specific characteristics like dimensions, size, and, and, uh, and height. Okay. So, when I will use my two factories, I will use image file factory, for example. And when I will ask new document, I will get a picture document. Otherwise, I will use a text file factory to get a text document. Okay. Um, last one, observer. So the observer pattern, um, which allows you to, um, uh, to capture events that occurs on, uh, on objects. So when an object emits a signal, it will notify a list of uh, observers that will trigger some, uh, some code. So this uh, pattern allows you to, um, uh, to easily plug in code on, uh, on a specific uh, signal. So it's mainly made for decoupling the dependencies uh, of your objects. Imagine you have this object, an order object, which is uh, an object you want to persist to the database. And when someone orders something on your, on your application, you will create a new instance of order. You will save uh, the order. So at this time, I want to, uh, to confirm the, the order. So in my database, I will save this status. And if the order is, uh, is confirmed, I want to log this information in my, uh, in my logging system, if there's a logger. And I also want to send an email to the customer, and I want to send an email to the sales department to inform them that they have a new uh, order. But the problem this, with this implementation is that my order class has too many dependencies. It has too many responsibilities. Okay? My order class contains the data of my order, and it also logs information, and it also sends emails. So it does too much thing. So I want to decouple this uh, uh, order objects and this uh, uh, piece of, pieces of code. Uh, so basically, uh, you have uh, a subject object. So the subject object is your order object in this example. And on your order object, you will register some observers. So we'll have listeners or observers that will listen to or observe your, uh, your subject object. And uh, all observers must have a notify uh, method. Okay, so you'll create uh, a concrete observer for uh, each task you want to, uh, to trigger when something occurs in your subje subject object. So basically, you can create an observer interface. Uh, and in your observer interface, you will define a notify uh, method. And the notify method will receive uh, the subject object, so the subject, the object that uh, notifies the, the listeners, the observers. And as you can see, we are receiving an, observ an observable interface. So the subject object uh, has the responsibility to attach some observers to, uh, to it, and then it will notify the observers. So let's say we have our logging, logging system, so I will decouple the logging stuff in, in, uh, in the dedicated class, the de dedicated class, which is logger handler, for example. And my logger handler is an observer, so I implement the observer interface. So I must implement a notify method. And remember, the notify method receives the subject object, so the other object in this situation. So when this uh, observer is notified, 
then we will log that the new order has been uh, confirmed, and that's all. If an order is confirmed, we also want to send an email, so we have a customer notify object, which only notifies the customer. So this object needs a mailer object to send uh, an email. It receives the order object, and then it just uh, sends uh, the email to the, to the customer. And we said that we also have to notify the sales department. So we have a sales notifier object, which is also an observer, which receives the order object, and which just compose, uh, composes the email to send to the sales department. Okay, so we have three different tasks to achieve. And then we will link this object to uh, the, uh, the subject object. So we said that an order object is a subject, so it must implement observable interface, which forces it to have the attach method. So I'm attaching uh, an, obser an observer to the, uh, to the order. And then we have the notify observers uh, method. So I will just iterate over the list of observers. And I know that as these objects are of this type, there is a notify uh, method on these uh, objects. And I will just pass myself to uh, the observer. Okay. So basically, in my order class, when I will confirm my, uh, my order, I will just uh, save the, the, the status of my order in my database or in my data store. And then I will just notify the observers. And then the three observers we created will be uh, triggered. If tomorrow you don't want uh, to notify the sales department or if you want to uh, if you don't want to, uh, to log the information because you are in production, you will just unregister one of these notifiers without touching the code in your order object. And that way, your order object remains uh, clean and, and very simple. It just contains the data of your, of your order. Okay, so there's my order object. And then I will just attach a list of uh, dependent objects to, uh, to trigger when something occurs in my, uh, in my order. So when I confirm the order, these three observers are notified. And if tomorrow I don't want to log anything, I just have to unregister this line, and that's all. Uh, my logger notifier won't be uh, triggered anymore. So you can find uh, the, uh, the implementation of the, uh, SPA, uh, the, of the observer uh, pattern in PHP. In the SPL, you have this SPL observer class to create um, an observer, and you have the SPL subject class to uh, create a subject. So you just have to, uh, I, don't know, I don't remember if, it's, uh, if there are abstract classes or interfaces in PHP, um, but you just have to make your subject implement or extend this class, and you have to make your observer uh, implement or extend the uh, SPL observer class. If you use, for example, if you use Symfony, in Symfony there's a component which is uh, the event dispatcher component, which is uh, an extended uh, implementation of this, uh, of this uh, observer pattern. So it provides extra features uh, like uh, stopping uh, the propagation of an event, or it can allow you to change the priority of your observers in your, in your object. And so I'm in the end. So as a conclusion, as you can see, Patterns uh, can save your life, they can ease your, uh, your, your development. Just use them uh, carefully, don't over-engineer the code. Um, try to keep things simple, uh, that's important, keep being pragmatic. But some of these patterns may be useful in PHP. Okay. And so, if you have any questions, feel free to ask.